1940, British test pilots strapped themselves into fighters powered by the most complex engine ever built. The Napier Sabre promised 3,000 horsepower, but delivered death. What turned Britain's revolutionary 24-cylinder monster from pilot killer to war winner? As the Luftwaffe's engines grew more powerful, Britain faced a terrifying reality. Their fighters were being outclassed. The Air Ministry demanded the impossible, an engine would double the power of anything flying ready yesterday. Into this pressure cooker stepped Napier and Son with a design so radical, so complex, that even its creators wondered if they'd gone too far. The Sabre would either revolutionize air combat or kill everyone who tried to tame it. The Napier Sabre wasn't just an engine, it was mechanical madness given form. Picture this, 24 cylinders arranged in an H pattern, 36.7 liters of displacement, sleeve valves instead of poppets, and a supercharger that screamed like a banshee. This aluminum beast could generate over 2,400 horsepower at launch, with potential for 3,000 and beyond. When bolted to the nose of a Hawker Typhoon or Tempest, it transformed fighters into ground attack demons that could outrun anything below 20,000 feet. The numbers alone were staggering. While the Merlin made do with 12 cylinders, the Sabre packed double that count into a package barely larger. Each cylinder fired with the force of a sledgehammer, 3,000 times per minute. Engineers called it the most power ever squeezed from a piston engine of its size. Pilots called it something else entirely, especially when it tried to kill them. The sleeve valve system was the Sabre's revolutionary heart and its Achilles heel. Instead of traditional poppet valves with springs and camshafts, each cylinder contained a sliding sleeve that rotated and reciprocated between the piston and cylinder wall. This sleeve had carefully machined ports that aligned with intake and exhaust passages at precise moments. The design allowed the engine to breathe at speeds that would have destroyed conventional valve trains, up to 3,700 RPM, unheard of for such a large engine. But this complexity came at a price. The Sabre contained over 3,000 individual parts, compared to the Merlin's 1,600. Each of these valve sleeves had to maintain clearances measured in ten thousandths of an inch while operating at temperatures that could melt aluminum. The engine consumed oil at an alarming rate. Pilots joked that you didn't check the oil level, you checked if there was any oil left. Starting procedures read like ancient ritual magic. Prime the cylinders in a specific sequence, warm the oil to exact temperature, engage the starter for precisely counted seconds, or face catastrophic failure. If you're fascinated by stories of engineering pushed to its absolute limits, subscribe now. We've got more legendary machines that danced on the edge of disaster. The Sabre's development was a nightmare wrapped in aluminum. Major Frank Halford's design looked brilliant on paper. Sleeve valves would eliminate the valve float that limited conventional engines, allowing unprecedented RPMs. But turning theory into reality nearly broke Napier. The sleeve valves, those revolutionary sliding cylinders within cylinders, became instruments of torture. They seized without warning, locking engines solid at full power. Test pilots found themselves in 400 mile per hour dives with dead engines and no way out. The manufacturing tolerances required were so precise that Britain's best machinists threw up their hands in despair. One ten thousandth of an inch too loose, and the engine leaked compression. Too tight, and it seized. Then came the oil ritual that drove crews mad. In cold weather, mechanics had to drain the oil each night and warm it by the stove, then pour it back before dawn missed the ritual, and the engine would destroy itself on startup. Ground crews worked through freezing nights knowing that one mistake meant a dead pilot in the morning. The Air Ministry grew nervous. Millions of pounds vanished into Napier's factories with little to show but blown engines and crashed prototypes. Bristol's air-cooled radials were proven and reliable. Rolls-Royce Griffin showed promise. Why chase this mechanical nightmare? If you're into stories of engineering courage against impossible odds, hit subscribe now. We've got more legendary power plants to uncover. But Frank Halford and his team refused to surrender. By late 1941, they'd tamed the worst of the Sabre's demons. When typhoons finally entered combat in 1942, the results were electrifying. At low altitude, nothing can touch them. Faka Wolf 190s that had terrorized RAF squadrons suddenly found themselves hunted. The Sabre's raw power meant typhoons could catch anything in a dive and outrun anything in level flight below 15,000 feet. When pilots opened to throttle, 2,400 horsepower erupted in a sound unlike anything else, a deep, guttural roar overlaid with the supercharger's howl. The engine that nearly died in development became the scourge of German transportation. Typhoons with rocket rails became train busters, their sabers pulling them through storms of flak that would have downed lesser machines. 
During the Normandy invasion, saber-powered fighters prowled ahead of Allied armies, their engines announcing doom to anything that moved. Squadron leader Roland Beaumont, one of the most experienced Typhoon pilots, captured the essence of flying with the saber. The saber was like riding a barely controlled explosion. When it worked, nothing could touch you. You had the power of gods at your fingertip. The transformation was remarkable. In 1943, 609 Squadron began converting from Spitfires to Typhoons. Initially, pilots mourned the loss of their nimble Spitfires for these heavyweight bruisers, but after their first combat missions, opinions shifted dramatically. Flight Lieutenant Johnny Baldwin destroyed three FW-190s in a single sortie, something he'd never achieved in a Spitfire. The Sabre gave you options, he recalled. Seeing a 190 diving away, pour on the cold and catch him. Bounce from above, open the taps and simply outrun them at sea level. The statistics were staggering. In the six months before D-Day, Sabre-powered Typhoons flew 11,000 sorties, destroying over 200 locomotives, 150 tanks and countless vehicles. But the numbers don't capture the psychological impact. German troops learned to fear the distinctive sound of approaching Sabres. Tank crews would abandon their vehicles at the first hint of that deep-throated roar. Train engineers would leap from their cabs rather than face rocket-firing Typhoons. The Sabre's reliability had improved dramatically too. Disastrous 25-hour overhaul periods of 1941, the engine now ran for 200 hours between major services. Napier engineers had developed new sleeve coatings, improved oil systems, and refined manufacturing tolerances. The killer had been tamed, but it retained its savage power. Pilots spoke of the Sabre with a mixture of respect and affection, like a dangerous pet that had finally learned not to bite its master. But here's what the history books rarely mention the intense political and corporate battles that nearly killed the Sabre before the Germans could. Behind closed doors, a fierce campaign unfolded that threatened Napier's revolutionary engine. The intercompany rival was real and vicious. Bristol's Roy Fedden, designer of the Hercules radial, saw the Sabre as a direct threat to his air-cooled empire. At air ministry meetings, Bristol representatives would present selective data showing the Sabre's early reliability problems while conveniently omitting that their Typhoon engines had suffered similar teething troubles. They emphasized every crash typhoon, every seized engine, every maintenance headache. Meanwhile, Rolls-Royce played a subtler but equally damaging game. While publicly supportive, they quietly suggested to officials that Napier lacked the manufacturing expertise for such a complex engine. Company representatives would point out that Napier was a smaller firm without Rolls-Royce's vast resources. Why risk the war effort on an unproven design from a secondary manufacturer? If the Air Ministry really wanted sleeve valves, perhaps the more experienced Rolls-Royce should take over the design. The most damaging opposition came from within the RAF itself. High-ranking officers who'd built their careers around other engines actively undermined the Sabre program. They influenced aircraft assignments, ensuring typhoons went to the worst maintained airfields with the least experienced ground crews. Positive combat reports were buried or minimized. Maintenance resources were diverted to other aircraft. One senior officer was overheard saying, the Typhoon will fail, and when it does, we'll go back to proper engines. Early production problems gave critics plenty of ammunition. Napier's mass production of the sleeves had led to issues with circularity. The sleeves weren't perfectly round, causing catastrophic seizures. The tolerances required were beyond what most British factories could achieve in 1941. Every failure was magnified, every success ignored. What the critics didn't mention was that the similar precision problems had plagued the Merlin, Griffin, and every other advanced engine in its early days. And perhaps the greatest irony, it was Bristol, Napier's fiercest competitor, that ultimately helped solve the sleeve valve crisis. Despite the corporate rivalry, Bristol engineers shared their hard-won knowledge of sleeve valve manufacturing techniques. This collaboration, born of wartime necessity overcoming peacetime composition, finally gave Napier the tools to produce reliable sleeves. The very company that had tried to bury the Sabre ended up saving it. But by then, irreparable damage had been done. The Whisper campaign had delayed development by months, perhaps years. Resources that should have gone to solving technical problems instead went to fighting political battles. How many pilots died because the Sabre's teething troubles weren't addressed sooner? How many aircraft were lost because maintenance crews weren't properly trained? The corporate warfare had a body count measured in Allied lives. The turning point came in 1944 when the Sabre finally found its champion, not in Britain, but in the mud of Normandy. As Allied armies pushed inland, they faced a crisis. German armor, hidden in forests and villages, ambushed advancing columns. Traditional fighter bombers couldn't deliver enough firepower fast enough. Enter the Tempest, 
Powered by the latest Sabre 5 producing 2,700 horsepower, these fighters didn't just attack, they obliterated. Flying at treetop height, Tempest could put rockets and cannon shells through Tiger tank roofs, then climb away before flak gunners could react. The engine that everyone tried to kill became the lifesaver of Allied infantry. The numbers spoke louder than any critic. In one month, Sabre-powered fighters destroyed over 200 tanks, 500 trucks, and 100 locomotives. Ground commanders started requesting typhoons and Tempest by name. One American general declared, I'll trade three squadrons of anything else for one squadron of those Napier-powered monsters. By war's end, the Sabre had evolved into the Mark VII, producing an astronomical 3,500 horsepower, more than any other piston engine in combat service. The mechanical disaster of 1940 had become the most powerful piston engine of the war. Production numbers tell only part of the story. Approximately 5,000 Sabres rolled off production lines, powering 3,317 Typhoons and 801 Tempest Fives and 142 Tempest Sixes. But the engine's true legacy went beyond statistics. The Sabre proved that revolutionary design could triumph over conservative thinking. Its sleeve valve technology influenced post-war engine development worldwide. The manufacturing techniques developed to build it, those impossibly precise tolerances, laid groundwork for the jet age. Yet the Sabre's greatest monument isn't in museums but in memory. Talk to any veteran who flew behind one and watch their eyes light up. They'll tell you about the distinctive sound, that deep, threatening growl that announced their arrival. They'll describe the surge of acceleration that pressed them into their seats, the feeling of having unlimited power on tap. Today, only a handful of Sabres survive in flying condition. When one fires up at an air show, something magical happens. The crowd doesn't just hear an engine, they hear the sound of determination, of engineers who refuse to quit, of pilots who trusted their lives to 24 cylinders of controlled chaos. The Napier Sabre teaches us that breakthrough innovation is never safe, never easy, and never welcomed by those who profit from the status quo. It reminds us that the greatest advances come not from incremental improvements, but from those brave enough to attempt the impossible. Every seized valve, every failed test, every crash prototype was a step toward victory, not just in war, but in the eternal battle between good enough and revolutionary. The Sabre's story proves that sometimes the most dangerous path leads to the greatest triumph. In the end, the engine that nearly killed its own pilots helped save a nation. That's not just engineering, that's destiny forged in aluminum and steel, proven in combat and remembered in glory. If you loved uncovering the Sabre's untold story, drop a like and subscribe for more legendary engines that changed history. What power plant should we investigate next? The Bristol Centaurus or the Pratt & Whitney R4360 Wasp Major? Let us know in the comments below and prepare for another deep dive into aviation's most incredible stories.